The Israeli army has been expanding its attacks in central and southern Gaza. Nearly two months into this conflict, the U.S. has used some of its strongest language to date, warning Israel to protect civilians. But just how long can this war go on for? And what would a victory look like? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. Israel's military has resumed its full-scale attack on the Gaza Strip, launching airstrikes on hospitals and crowded residential areas. Nearly 16,000 Palestinians have now been killed since early October. That figure is rising by the hour. The limited number of aid trucks going into the Strip are nowhere near enough to meet the needs of millions of desperate people. And after nearly two months of war, Israel's biggest ally appears to be changing its tone and warning against civilian deaths in Gaza. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin says Israel risks a strategic defeat if it doesn't do more to protect civilians. It's a sentiment being shared by other senior U.S. officials. So what's behind this sudden warning from Washington? We'll put that to our guests in just a moment. First, this report from Fintan Monahan. A clear warning to Israel from its most important ally. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin made his concerns clear. If Israel doesn't do more to prevent civilian deaths in Gaza, its war is doomed to fail in the long run. You see, in this kind of a fight, the center of gravity is the civilian population. And if you drive them into the arms of the enemy, you replace a tactical victory with a strategic defeat. So I have repeatedly made clear to Israel's leaders that protecting Palestinian civilians in Gaza is both a moral responsibility and a strategic imperative. Just days earlier, the U.S. Secretary of State also urged Israel to adjust its strategy. More than 15,000 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces in Gaza. And shortages of essential supplies are making life there nearly impossible. I made clear that after the pause, it was imperative that Israel put in place clear protections for civilians uh, and for sustaining humanitarian assistance uh, going forward. While Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has admitted his forces have failed to minimize civilian deaths, he places the blame on Hamas. Israel accuses the armed group of placing its military assets in civilian buildings without providing much evidence. Hamas wants to kill as many Israelis as possible and has no regard whatsoever to Palestinian lives. Every day, they perpetrate a double war crime, targeting our civilians while hiding behind their civilians, embedding themselves in the civilian population and using them as human shields. Israel's bombing campaign has reduced entire neighborhoods to rubble and displaced hundreds of thousands of Palestinians. Many in the international community, including the UN Secretary General, have called on Israel to rethink its strategy and do more to protect civilians. Now, with the U.S., its closest ally, joining the chorus, it's not clear yet if Israel will change its tactics. Vincent Monaghan for Inside Story. Well, let's bring in our guests now. And in Ramallah, Bushra Khalidi, policy lead in the occupied Palestinian territory and Israel at Oxfam. In Brussels, Elijah Magnier, military and political analyst. And in Cairo, Hussein Haridi, a former assistant foreign minister of Egypt. A very warm welcome to all of you. Elijah Magnier, <laughs> these are some of the strongest or are the strongest warnings for Israel to protect civilians that we've heard publicly from the US. Why are we hearing them now? I think it's very interesting to hear that the Americans are taking some distance of what Israel is committing as violating international laws and obvious crimes against humanity and war crimes. It is something very good to hear the, Israel, the American officials saying that uh, the Israelis cannot continue killing civilians. And they have to be careful how to bomb Gaza. So that is, first of all, an acknowledgement that Israel is indeed 
killing civilians, and the result is we have 16,000 people killed, of which 70 to 80 percent are civilians. Secondly, it is why the Americans are saying it, and if that uh, serves some purposes. Now, mm. it is not serving any purpose because the Israelis continue the war. If it's, this is going to put an end to the military operation, it is not, obviously, because yesterday was the most intensive bombardment on Gaza. And what is the final purpose? And to my view, the final purpose is more of a presidential U.S. campaign because there is no strict position that the Americans is taking to tell the Israelis that they have to stop their war on children and women because mm. this is the only tactical victory that they have achieved so far. Hussein Haridi, as a former ambassador and from your time in the Egyptian foreign ministry, you've got uh, experience of the diplomatic machinery between the US and Israel. How far do you think Israel is likely to heed these sterner warnings from the US? Uh, at the outset, madam, uh, let me express my, uh, my, my solidarity with the Palestinian resistance and with the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. And my thoughts and the thoughts of many Egyptians, the majority of Egyptians, go out for the more than 16,000 Palestinians mm. who died, who have died under the Israeli bombardment. Having said so, I guess uh, in the not far distant future, the Israeli war cabinet would have to listen, would have to heed the messages, the latest messages coming out of Washington, whether on the part of U the United States President Joe Biden or the Secretary of State uh, Tony Blinken, or lately uh, General uh, Lloyd Austin, the uh, the Secretary of Defense. I guess the messages coming out of Washington are loud and clear. We are one step, we are one step away from the American administration calling for a ceasefire. When will now the the the, the question is not whether it would call for a ceasefire, but the question is uh, probably when it will do so. My personal take on the on the positions uh, of the senior American officials is that uh, uh, we could, in the uh, next uh, few weeks, uh, hear the word ceasefire coming out of Washington. OK, the, let's, let's uh, just uh, get Elijah back on, on that one point there. Do you agree that we're one step away from the US calling for a ceasefire? Because that's certainly not on the table at the moment. Yes, we are very far from a ceasefire because the Israelis haven't achieved any of their objectives. This is why I call uh, so far the Israelis facing a tactical defeat because they claim they have occupied 40 percent of north of Gaza, of which half of it is an open air agriculture terrain. Secondly, we've seen how the Palestinian resistance are uh, inflicting heavy casualties on the Israeli occupation forces. And third, we've seen every single day the Palestinian resistance capable of bombing different cities and villages, including Tel Aviv. And that happened this morning. And also, we have seen how the release of the captives happened in the heart of the north of Gaza, where the Palestinian resistance is not yet in direct contact on a daily basis with the Israelis, because the Israelis are too afraid to be in contact in a dense area against the Palestinian resistance. So achieve a calling for a ceasefire now, we are so far away, because that means a total defeat for Benjamin Netanyahu, for his right-wing government, who threatened to uh, offer a resignation if he doesn't invade all of Gaza mm. and kill all Palestinians, and then he will go directly to jail. It is in the advantage of Netanyahu to continue this war. He expressed there are differences with the Americans because the Americans understand that this way 
has exposed the weakness of what used to be called the strongest army in the Middle East. And it turned out that a bunch of Palestinian resistance confronting this a tremendous army that is capable of bombarding, has a tremendous firepower, but is afraid to confronting the Palestinian resistance on the okay. ground. So, Okay, Elijah, I'll, I'll get back to uh, the state of the battlefield in just a moment. Before we get too uh, sort of bogged down in that, I want to bring in Bushra because we need to get in a very clear picture of what we're actually talking about when the US is warning to protect civilians. How much civilians need these kind of warnings for Israel to do more. Bushra, since the ceasefire broke down on Friday, we've seen some of the most intense fighting in Gaza and airstrikes on the south. Can you bring us up to speed with what the people there are suffering, what they're having to put up with? Um, I first want to talk about the sense of safety that has been completely eroded, um, namely in children, because children form part of half of Gaza's population. Um, and, and, and this sense of safety is eroded because, of course, it's already eroded from, you know, six previous military escalations, living under a brutal Israeli, you know, illegal siege, uh, collectively punishing, you know, uh, an entire population for over 16 years. Uh, but it's even more eroded because now uh, they have been displaced once, twice. We know of colleagues who have been displaced up to six times. Um, in the last eight weeks, and and uh, I have my own uh, in-laws that are in Gaza, and right now the worry is not just spending hours to find water, spending hours to find food, um, trying to you know adapt to this new way of life with no electricity and no washing machines and no ovens and no gas stoves and no you know uh, 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 Gaza is uh, you know is not is not was not the Middle Ages mm. uh, uh, before the 7th of October it was yes very poor and people definitely depended on aid but people were not uh, you know uh, making bread in, in uh, over wood fires and he water over wood fires. So, you know, on top of adapting to this new way of life, people are having to worry about when is my turn to leave again. And, and, and even my nephews are talking about, mom, can you make us a backpack with our stuff on our own? Um, because we never know what happens. Something might mm. happen to you and I don't want you to have my things with you, you know, and, and he's seven years old. So that is the, 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 the maturity that we're forcing children into uh, in Gaza uh, and with these uh, multiple evacuation orders with nowhere safe to go mm. and with a completely collapsed um, uh, wash system, uh, no electricity and no calm lines. Uh, I think the, the mental health aspect beyond being hungry and thirsty is also something that now is beginning to show um, mm. with people just really losing hope. And Bushra, people are being told by the Israeli military to move further and further south. This is 1.8 million people in the south already, so many of them displaced from the north. They've moved two, three, four times already. Moving further south towards Rafah, towards the crossing, towards the border with Egypt, what exists in that area for them? What infrastructure, what shelter, what food, what water? Well, we're talking about 60% of the entire Gaza Strip um, uh, being bombarded. What we've seen over the last four days, we're talking about carpet bombing of entire neighborhoods. We already have reports back of wash infrastructure being completely damaged. Um, uh, uh, shelters having been struck over the weekend as well, both in the north and in the south. Um, and, and a non-operational health sector. I mean, we cannot say that the current hospitals that are in the south that are partially operating are operating health system. It's not. Mm. Um, uh, squeezing people into a place that's uh, ba basically as big as London Heathrow Airport. We're talking about 1.8 million people in an airport, just so that I can kind of paint the picture to people who don't really understand how small Gaza is. Um, it's already overpopulated. It's actually inhumane and actually uh, not only makes it 
impossible to deliver aid to 1.8 million people in one place. Uh, it's much actually easier when you have shelters all around and different distribution points because you relieve the pressure off one, um, but you increase the, the the risk of disease, that which we're already saying, where there's already reports of cholera, uh, gastroenteritis is uh, spread like wildfire in Gaza right now. People are have been sick for the last month. My family has been sick and are not getting better because mm. conditions are not allowing for them to get better and squeezing people into into that basically it does not absolve israel of its um duties and obligation under international actually in fact it is it could amount to a serious violation or serious grave breach of humanitarian law forcing people uh into a small uh, uh okay. place and also historically just want to add one point historically these kind of safer spaces um or safe zones or you know humanitarian areas as they've been dubbed in the last couple of weeks actually have brought more harm onto civilian population than actually meeting their needs so okay. it's it's extremely concerning and, and Hussein, as you see people being pushed closer and closer to Rafah, to this southern part of Gaza, which borders Egypt, what is the conversation in Cairo as you see this movement of people? Well, of course, uh, here in Egypt, uh, there is uh, near certainty that one of the uh, objectives of the Israeli military campaign or, or aggression against Gaza is to push the Palestinians to towards Sinai. Mm. And on the other hand, the same is taking place in the West Bank in light of the uh, harassment by the settlers against the Palestinians everywhere in the West Bank, uh, to the extent that they have been uh, issuing uh, pamphlets warning the Palestinians that a second Nakba is on the way. Mm. So here in Egypt, here in Egypt, uh, the majority believe that this is the next move on the part of the Israelis. The long-term objective of this war against the Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank is to push the Palestinians uh, towards Sinai uh, from Gaza and towards uh, and would, and would the Egyptian government, would Abdel Fattah al-Sisi ever accept that? No, uh, of course, uh, uh, for the last uh, eight weeks, uh, Egypt uh, uh, has, 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 has been in talks with the American administration and uh, warning against uh, the forced displacement of the Palestinians. And uh, the American administration has adopted and has supported the Egyptian position and, and, and we keep, uh, the Egyptian government uh, keep saying, keep repeating its warning that it won't uh, accept the forced displace displacement of the Palestinians uh, towards Sinai. Okay, Elijah, let me just bring you in there, because it does seem that we are getting warnings from all sides for Israel not to act in certain ways, but Israel doesn't seem to be paying any attention. What leverage can be brought to Israel, either from Egypt or the US or any of the other countries that are currently giving it a green light? This is a very excellent question. Actually, all the Arab countries are doing virtually nothing to support the Palestinians apart from talking and rejecting what's happening. And Israel understands that there is no weight from the Arab countries who have a lot of strength, force, and leverage cost to play against Israel and against the Americans to force a ceasefire, to open a border. All the Arab countries were not able to bring through Egypt, the Rafah crossing, one single truck without the approval of the Israelis who mm. are counting trucks and counting how many trucks, what in the trucks, and where these trucks can go and to whom. So we have seen the position of the Arab countries extremely weak to the point that there is no cut of total relationship with Israel. We only have seen the recall of ambassadors that the Israelis understand that at the end of the war, all these ambassadors will return to their functions. We okay. have actually seen an extremely shy reaction. 
Let's let Hussein uh, have a chance to respond to that. So what's your response to Elijah's comments that Arab countries are doing nothing? And in particular, uh, why can't Egypt open and control the Rafah crossing itself? Well, we, we do exercise on the Rafah crossing uh, uh, unimpeded. Uh, it's a, it's a, we, we are applying our sovereignty on the Rafah crossing, the Egyptian side of the Rafah crossing, because the Rafah crossing has two sides, the Palestinian and the Egyptian one. So of course, how, we don't why, have... why are the Israelis it's so much in charge there then? Well, uh, the, the, the Israelis uh, do... Uh, checks in order to prevent, of course, this is an excuse, to prevent the smuggling of weapons inside Gaza. But well, do, do you agree with those this, checks at this point in time, given how much they slow up the amount of aid that is reaching Gaza, as we've heard from Bushra? People desperately need more aid to get in, but it is these Israeli checks that are stopping that. That's, that's right. That's right, Madam. And, and that's why we, in our uh, diplomatic uh, conversation with the American administration, we keep insisting, we keep insisting on the absolute need to increase humanitarian assistance to, to Gaza, to, to Gaza. And in fact, the Americans, uh, in, the Americans have uh, positively uh, uh, responded to our request, and they have promised before the, of course, the uh, resumption of hostilities in Gaza. Uh, they promised, uh, or they talked about, not not, not less than 100 trucks would uh, enter. Uh, the Rafah uh, crossing uh, on a daily basis. Mm. So our dipl our diplomatic contacts with the American administration uh, is continuing, and of course, as we as we have witnessed in the last few days, the American position vis-à-vis -vis the overall situation in the Gaza Strip is evolving, and uh, we have noticed that it's it's evolving, albeit very slowly. It's mm. evolving, in, if I may use this term, in the direction that we would like to steer it to. OK, to, to. let's just bring Bushra back into this conversation to again bring this discussion to events on the ground. As you can hear from Hussein, and the reality is that the tone towards the war, towards Israel, is evolving, but it's evolving slowly. It, it, it's, mean, it can't evolve slowly, can it? There is no time for an no, evolution, it, it, and there's I no mean, time for promises of trucks. What needs to happen now? I mean, the WHO said that we are at the brink of an epidemic that might kill more people than bombs have. Um, so, you know, and it's not just about the trucks and the trucks, you know, is a, a small need. It's a need, but it's about the crossings in Israel being open. It's about restoring water. It's about restoring electricity from Israel into the Strip, uh, bringing in trucks of aid and uh, some flour and some water and some blankets is not enough and does not meet the current needs um, in, in Gaza. We're talking about, I, I, I said it, 60 percent of Gaza being um, uh, and to rubble, we're mm. talking about almost 10,000 bodies under the rubble. Who are, you know, what about, you know, burying those um, relatives and family members and fathers and mothers? Um, roads are completely damaged, even in terms of delivering the aid through truck um, is, is, is a challenge inside. We're also having checks inside Gaza um, by uh, armed troops. So, uh, you know, it, it, we're in, in, there's a principle of unfettered humanitarian access um, in terms international law. Uh, all of these are fettered uh, to our access as humanitarians. We're not even allowed in to carry out assessments, um, uh, uh, to carry out uh, repairs. Uh, there's a lot of materials that are not allowed in, uh, very simple materials like the sheets of a wash latrine we're trying mm. to get in. That's not That's been restricted. So it, every, every obstacle, and it's much too slow, it's not enough. Um, and really, it's 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 like I said, eroding the sense of hope and and safety in Gazans. And the long term impacts of that uh, is also something that we should be considering. OK, um, you know, let's, let's so. uh, bring back Elijah at this point, because I want to get back to what the U.S. Secretary of State Lloyd Austin said. He said that the that Israel risks strategic defeat if it doesn't protect civilians more. What does strategic defeat look like? 
To my mind, it is already a strategic defeat. A bunch of Palestinian resistance in Gaza managed to stop the almighty Israeli occupation forces at the gate of Gaza in a very tiny geographic area. And at the end of the day, it's not bad that the Arabs are not interfering because it seems that the Palestinians can manage on their own to challenge the Israeli army. This is already something that the Americans are fully aware of because they think it in a cool head. They understand that the Israelis in 50 days did not manage to occupy and control, because they need to control it, 20% of the uh, residential area of northern Gaza. That is a strategic defeat that Israel has lost its image in the whole world. And it shows how, when you have determined people to stand against the occupation forces, no matter how brutal they are, okay. Israel has managed in, in its war against the children and the women, but not against the men of the Palestinian resistance. OK, Ambassador Haradi, Haridi, do you believe that Israel has already suffered a strategic defeat, or is there time for a turnaround? Well, I guess after almost almost eight weeks of uh, constant uh, bombardment, uh, with the exception of the uh, seven-day pause that ended the last Friday, they haven't. Uh, the Israeli arm, uh, army has failed to achieve the uh, objectives that Israel announced, or the Israeli prime minister had announced on October 7th, and he keeps repeating them, namely the destruction of Hamas, the release of the hostages, and to make sure that the Gaza Strip would, would impose mm. a threat to Israeli security. Nothing, nothing of these objectives uh, has been realized so far. And so the Israelis are in a dilemma. And uh, they cannot speak of, of achieving military victory after mm -hmm. eight weeks of uh, nonstop bombardment and the, their tanks entering some major uh, cities in, in the Gaza Strip. So, okay. of course, the Palestinian resistance, the Palestinian resistance is, is, is showing determination and sure there we that have to has... leave our discussion today. Uh, uh, Hussein Haidi, apologies for interrupting your final answer there, but we definitely we understood your point. Uh, many thanks to all of our guests, Bushra, Khalidi, Elijah, Magnair and Hussein Haridi. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. For further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle and the whole team here, it's bye for now.